Hi everyone! During this phonetics and phonology unit, we learned that the sounds we produce aren't always the sounds we are thinking of. Sometimes phones are influenced by constraints or neighboring sounds, which motivates some sort of alternation. For phonological analysis, linguists look at speech sounds in order to answer what is changing, why, and how is this sound stored in the brain. In this video, we will break down some strategies and steps for analyzing data and answering these questions. Before we jump in, here is some more transcription practice. You can pause the video in order to complete the warm-up. All right, thank you for your practice. I hope IPA is starting to feel easier. I want to start our discussion of phonological analysis with the concept of a rule. A rule is the answer to a phonological problem because it captures what is changing and why. When linguists see a rule, they understand that language is predictable and something specific is happening. Here is the structure of a rule. It translates to phone X becomes a different phone Y in the phonetic environment, otherwise it is phone Z. Let's look at some examples to see what this means. Here is one that we've talked about before, nasalization. We saw that vowels changed when they were close to a nasal sound. They became more nasal-like. Here's how you'd write a rule for that. Vowels are nasalized preceding nasal consonants, such as when B becomes B. Note that this isn't just one phoneme. The rule applies to all vowels. Rules can apply to natural classes or groups of sounds. I'll also point out that we use C and V to stand for consonant and vowel. Here's another example of a rule. Vowels are lengthened preceding voice consonants, like rope versus robe. C underscore D here is the rule structure that represents the environment. We pay attention to any sound before and after what we are focusing on. By pay attention, I mean looking at place, manner, voicing, height, segment, etc. You might see a few other symbols and rules. The pound sign represents a word boundary, the start or end of a word. The null symbol represents nothing and is usually in rules about insertion, where nothing becomes something. Now that we know what rules look like, it can help guide us with analysis. We know we need to determine if a predictable change is taking place and what environment causes that change. Here are some steps to find that environment. First, organize your data. Linguists would first gather lots of phonetic data to see if a pattern is occurring. It is beneficial to organize this data into two target groups, either the sounds you are targeting or minimal pairs. Next, identify the phonetic environments for each distribution. This means looking at those features like place, manner, voicing, height, or even stress and syllable position. We usually make a table that identifies these characteristics for the phones before and after the target sound. It can feel laborious to write out the environment, but it is how we will see the pattern. And I included an example on this slide to illustrate how organization is beneficial. This example is the data from last class for words like bugs, matches, and butts. We knew S was taking various forms. When the data is presented like this, can you see what motivates this change or alternation? What do these sounds have in common? This questioning is what makes the final step. Identify what each has in common and write a rule. What generalizations can we make about what is happening here? You might notice that phones change when next to a certain place or manner, or from a certain position in the syllable. Once you've confirmed that yes, this is a predictable pattern, you can use the rule structure from before to define it. This rule would confirm that an alternation is taking place and support that these are phones, these phones are allophones, that we stored these sounds together mentally. I mentioned last class that the concept of allophones is like a folder in a filing cabinet. We might have a folder marked N for alveolar nasal that contains the alveolar nasal and the velar nasal. How do we know though that the folder is the end and not the velar nasal? We say that the underlying phoneme or the representative phoneme on that folder is the one that is least predictable. Why this one? The fact the phone can be least predictable suggests it's our default pronunciation. Let's try applying these steps together in some analysis. 
Here is a problem from the textbook. It tells us that the alveolar plosive and the dental fricative seem to be phonetically similar. We wonder, could these sounds be allophones in Spanish? Are we storing them together in the brain? Let's find out with step one, organizing our data. Here's the start of my first chart that organizes my data. Since the problem specifies what phones to focus on, I set up a column for the plosive and the fricative. I could also try to organize my data by minimal pairs if I noticed any. Take some time to make your own chart, separating words that contain the plosive and words that contain the fricative. Once that chart is complete, we have step two. Identify the phonetic environment. Is there a feature that would motivate some sort of alternation here? I start with a chart just for the plosive. I focus on what is happening before and after my target sound. After I complete this chart, I would make another for the fricative. Again, pause and take some time to make your chart. I'm sure as you start filling it out, you will see a pattern. Sometimes the pattern isn't as obvious. In that case, you might have to think about both before and after together, natural classes, or super segmental features. Our last step is to see if there's a pattern and a rule. According to my chart, the plosive occurs at the start of the word and after L and N. The fricative occurs between vowels. The plosive seems hard to explain, but there's a clear pattern or environment for the fricative. Since I see a predictable pattern, I know I can write a rule. This phonological analysis found a rule and can conclude that these two phones are allophones. However, there are three possible outcomes to a problem. You can use this chart on the slide or one from the book to guide you about the types of conclusions. First, your data could show two separate environments with no overlap. This is like the problem we just completed. This means the plosive never occurs in environments specific to the fricative and vice versa. You could conclude that since there are two distinct environments and they are predictable, these are allophones of one phoneme in complementary distribution. Another option is that your data doesn't show two distinct environments. The sounds are unpredictable and you can't find any rule or pattern. This would indicate free variation, like a dialect. Lastly, your data could not show distinct environments. In fact, you notice minimal pairs with contrastive meanings. This would indicate that these are separate, unrelated phonemes. Some linguists prefer to start analysis by looking for minimal pairs and ruling out the possibility of separate phonemes. It can save you some time. You're welcome to do this approach. I tend to start with data organization as it makes the problem much more approachable for me and it's good practice. Here is how I present my final answer. I show my work, the chart, I write my rule, and I make my conclusion. You could also expand your analysis by probing the idea further. What alternation describes this process? Why would we want a fricative between vowels instead of a stop? Why do I assume the plosive is what changes and not the fricative? We will practice this skill more next week. For now, you can try an exercise from the book. It's okay to just start by organizing data. Phonological analysis is a lot like jigsaw puzzles. You need to organize your pieces and build the border first. Then you can start to see how everything fits in. If you have questions, just let me know. You can also use the script to see the answers and review these steps.